was here uh, for the very happy month that I spent in Darwad. Um, I'm also very happy to be talking to you uh, on the subject of a book that I started writing last time I was here in Darwad three years ago, which as you will hear in a minute, you've heard already, you will hear in a minute, is about a library, a great library, one of the great library projects uh, in history, started by the son, the, the bastard son of Christopher Columbus, Hernando Colon, uh, and which was meant to be a universal library. Uh, and by that I mean a library that would have one copy of every book on every subject, in every language, from within Christendom and outside of Christendom, all in one place, uh, in Seville, in southern Spain. Now, you might think it's a little strange to decide to start writing a book about a Spanish library from the 16th century uh, here in Darwad, uh, but actually there's a long history of this. Um, the great literary scholar Eric Auerbach uh, whose book Mimesis, uh, which is a description of uh, the representation of reality in Western literature. So it, it tries to give a history of the entire way in which European literature has talked about reality uh, from the very earliest times to the present day. Auerbach was only able to undertake this great project when he was living in exile uh, during the Second World War. He was a German Jew. And he found that this enormous topic was something that he could only begin to see the outlines of when he was away from his books, when he was in exile, living in Istanbul. And so I think in a similar way, uh, my project about Hernando Colón's Universal Library could only uh, begin once uh, I got away from my books and I could stop reading and start writing. So, as I'm going to suggest o over the coming uh, minutes, uh, and I promise it won't be too long, uh, great libraries can be wonderful things, but they can also be terrifying things. Um, they can be things that frighten you, that you will uh, never find, you know, never be able to read all of the books in them and start writing yourself, uh, that you'll never find. Uh, the book that you're looking for, or maybe that the book that you're looking for is, is hidden in some section of the library that you'll never enter. Um, and just to, just to illustrate this idea, um, before I start talking about Hernando Colón, I think the great, the great poet of this idea is the wonderful Argentinian story writer George Luis Borges, um, who writes a story about the Library of Babel. Um, and this story is narrated from the perspective of someone who lives in the library. He was born in the library. He's about to die uh, in the library. He's never been outside the library because Borges's library is an infinite library. It is made up of a series of hexagonal rooms put together like a series of tiles. And all of the rooms uh, have floor to ceiling books. Um, in some ways this sounds like a, a, a book lover's dream, uh, but actually the books are made up of every possible combination of the 22 standard letters uh, that the Spanish use and a full stop, a comma and a space. So many of the books are nonsense. Perhaps the majority of the books are nonsense. But there are also copies of every book that has ever been written, and every book that has never been written, as well as versions of every book that has been written that have one mistake in them, or ten mistakes, or a thousand mistakes. And Borges's point uh, is that an infinite library, and this is different from a universal library, so a universal library has one book, uh, one copy of every book, the infinite library has an infinite number of books. The infinite library is a terrifying thing, uh, because you will never be able to organize it. There are no boundaries to it, and things require boundaries in order for you to start to organize them. Um, so any library that has boundaries at least offers the possibility of being organized in some way. 
So I'm going to move on now to talk about, uh, just briefly, about this particular library in Spain, which I started writing about here in Dawa three years ago. And I'm going to start by telling you a story from the childhood of this character, Hernando Colón, Christopher Columbus's son. And this story takes place on the 29th of February, uh, 1504. So Hernando, at that time, was 14 years old, and he had been living on a shipwreck with his father for nine months off the coast of Jamaica in the Caribbean. So Hernando, despite being an illegitimate son, had been chosen by Columbus to accompany him on his fourth and what turned out to be his last voyage uh, to the New World. Uh, and Columbus was not taking his son to show off the things that he felt he had discovered. Uh, Columbus thought of the New World as his own personal gift to Spain, uh, but he was not taking Hernando uh, to show off. He was taking Hernando to try and complete the task that had always obsessed Christopher Columbus, because as I'm sure you all know, Christopher Columbus was not trying to find America. Uh, of course, like any great traveller in the early modern period, he was trying to find India. It was the only thing that mattered at the time. Maybe it's the only thing that matters now. Uh, but he was trying to find India. So he took his son with him uh, to try and complete this voyage around the world. Christopher Columbus wanted to be the first person to sail all the way around the world and to go, uh, go west around the world and return to Spain from the east. Um, but they had spent a year uh, working their way along the coast of Panama and failing to find a way through to what is now known as the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it became increasingly obvious that this was not going to work. They gave up, rather ironically they gave up right where the exit to the Panama Canal is today. Uh, so <laughs> had they been 400 years later they might have had better luck. Um, but uh, they headed north to try and get back to the places of the Caribbean that there were Spanish people in, uh, in order to get more food and, and, and to return to safety. But it wasn't going to happen, because the ships were full of holes. Two of the four ships that they set out with had sunk, um, and the other two were so full of holes that Hernando described them as being like a piece of honeycomb. Uh, more whole than anything else. So they ended up having to run their ships aground off the Caribbean and by the 29th of February 1504 they had been there for nine months and originally uh, the natives uh, of Jamaica had been very welcoming, had been very friendly but after nine months they'd begun to got, get rather bored and annoyed by these Spanish intruders and the goods that the Spanish bought with them to trade, you know, famously they only bought with them glass beads and uh, little bells and things like that. The local market was flooded with these products and the Taino Indians were no longer interested in trading with the Spanish for food. So things were looking very grim. The Spanish were looking off, out, sorry, running out of food um, and uh, you know, uh, things, uh, they, there was no prospect of rescue from Spain uh, and it wasn't quite sure what they were, they were going to do. But luckily for Hernando, uh, his father was one of the greatest magicians, one of the greatest charlatans, uh, one of the greatest Barnum and Bailey style circus showmen uh, the world has ever produced. Uh, and he had with him on the ship two books two magic books. One of them was a series of prophecies from the Bible uh, and other texts which Columbus felt predicted that he was going to be the man to finish this epic voyage. But this was not the book that saved them that day. Uh, the book that saved them that day was a flimsy little pamphlet uh, by a Spanish Jew called Abraham Zacuto. And this pamphlet was called uh, The Ephemerides. Uh, or almanac, so it was a, uh, a table of predicted lunar cycles and star positions and so on and so forth. Uh, 
And Columbus knew from this table that on that very day, the 29th of February 1504, there was going to be a lunar eclipse. Um, so he summoned the local people and he said to them, my God, my God is a vengeful God. And tonight he's going to swallow the moon in order to prove to you what will happen if you refuse to give us food. Now, as you see, he was a great uh, circus performer. Uh, the tension that night, I think, must have been completely unbearable uh, because uh, not only um, had they been away from other Europeans who used the same calendar for almost a year uh, and had survived storms and malarial fevers and all sorts of other things, so they probably couldn't be that sure that it actually was the 29th of February after all. Uh, and obviously, if he, if he had the date wrong, the, uh, the trick would rather be ruined. Uh, but even worse than that, at that time, there was no way of measuring longitude. Uh, so there was no way of knowing exactly how far away Jamaica was from Spain. So whereas they knew what time the eclipse was going to happen in Spain, they had no idea what time it was going to happen in Jamaica. And if the eclipse happened before the sun went down, the effect would rather be ruined. Um, luckily for Columbus and for Hernando, Columbus's incredible luck uh, held one more time and Hernando writes in the biography of his father which to which we owe most of our knowledge about Christopher Columbus that as the sun set uh, the moon perfectly succumbed to the earth's penumbra the, the uh, island was cast in darkness and a huge howl went up from the shore uh, and the Taino were duly terrified and agreed to provide the Spanish uh, with food. And the reason why I'm, I'm telling this story is because of these two books. These two books that they took with them. And it was precisely that kind of little flimsy book, a very cheap book of only 20 pages or so, uh, that were, Hernando was to put at the center of his own library project. And this was what was utterly revolutionary about what Hernando did. So most other libraries uh, at the time collected books that they felt were precious, right? So usually manuscripts, often in, with beautiful gold leaf pages and jewels on the cover and things like that, but only the most important books in the world. So the Vatican Library, for instance, um, was founded by, or, or the, the nucleus of it was founded uh, in the 15th century and it also claimed to be a universal library which had every book but it only had 361 books in it right not that big of a library but by universal what they meant was all the books that matter right all the most important most authoritative books whereas what Hernando decided to do was to collect everything uh, a copy of absolutely everything uh, that had uh, been printed, uh, a copy of every book. Um, and this was, of course, right near the beginning of the print revolution. So the kinds of information that was being produced and circulated uh, was of a very different order. So these kinds of books like uh, almanacs, poetry, early newsletters, uh, even erotic writings, all of these things Hernando would would gather together and put in his universal library uh, of all books. But Hernando, like Borges, uh, realized that a huge library, and by his death, Hernando had by far the largest library in Europe. It was 15,321 books, uh, which is not that huge by modern standards, but it was about, yeah, sorry, at least 10 times bigger than, than the biggest other libraries in Europe at the time. Hernando realized that this kind of library was actually dangerous. It was problematic unless you had a way to organize it. Because like the infinite library, unless like the searcher in Borges's infinite library who's looking for the catalog of catalogs, 
which will actually make sense of this infinite library. Like that person, Hernando knew that if you couldn't create a catalogue for a library, for, for the library, it would actually be useless, or worse than useless, it would be a, a nightmare. Um, like, I'm sure you've all been into a library where there's not a proper catalogue, and it's very difficult to find the books, it's very frustrating. Hernando was so proud of the catalogues that he created, uh, that when he created his own tomb uh, just before his death, he put on his tomb images of his four main catalogues, which he considered to be the great achievements of his life. Because um, Hernando was someone who was obsessed not only with collecting things, and I've only mentioned the library here, but he also had the greatest collection of images uh, in Europe in the day, the greatest collection of printed music. Uh, he started probably the first botanical garden uh, that uh, the world had ever, uh, sorry, that Europe had ever seen. Um, and he created enormous numbers of lists. He started a geographical dictionary, a dictionary of the Latin language, uh, which only got as far as the letter B. Uh, uh, but before you laugh at him too much, uh, by the time he reached the letter B, he had covered 1,476 pages of definitions. Uh, uh, only up until the word bibo in Latin, which means I drink. Uh, so perhaps he had something on his mind when he finished, the, uh, finished that, that castle. So he was obsessed with listing things. There are wonderful lists from early on in his life. Uh, when he was in Jamaica for the second, sorry, in, in Hispaniola for the second time, in which he lists everything that he had around him, right down to little pieces of string, uh, and uh, bits of paper and so on and so forth, as well as 236 books in four chests, which may have been the first book library uh, in the New World, in the Americas. So, but Hernando's book library uh, in Hispaniola in 1509 starts to beg a question of what exactly is a library. So Hernando thought of his library as universal, right? It sounds enormous. It sounds like it's going to contain everything. But just the fact that you say it's going to contain every book is already drawing a boundary, and a very strong boundary, because the codex, uh, what we now think of as a book, is a very historically and culturally specific thing. Uh, I was incredibly lucky to visit, uh, well, last time I was here, the Oriental Institute uh, in Misuru, uh, where they have a wonderful library of palm leaf books, uh, these sacred texts written on palm leaves. Obviously, those have to be stored in a different way. They're not shaped like books. So, um, unlike books, uh, which it, it might be a box of chocolates, but this works just as well either way. Um, a book nowadays uh, we would normally put on a shelf like that. Yeah, that was actually something that was invented by Hernando. So if you have a bookcase in your house where you store books, that was invented by Hernando Colon as a solution for what to do when you have 15,000 books. Books before that in Europe used to be stored like this, right? But the problem with storing books like this is if you have a stack of books and you pull out the, bo the bottom one, all of the others fall over, right? Like this, you can pull the book out and the rest are fine. So he invented a system for storing books like this uh, on uh, on shelves attached to the wall. Books are also very heavy, uh, so the shelves on the wall allowed the book's weight to be displaced against the wall. I know uh, of a, uh, a university professor in Australia who had so many books on the wall that the side of his house fell off. Um, so you, you need to keep it below a certain level. But... Uh, but uh, Choosing to have a universal library 
if it defines itself as a universal library of books, is actually saying, is actually drawing a line around the kind of knowledge that you put in your library. So, in a sense, it was European knowledge, because Hernando focused on uh, printed books. Uh, obviously, he meant European printed books, uh, and books in that form, the codex book, was a very European form. So it would have excluded things like palm leaf books. And also, uh, whereas I said that Hernando's collection of 236 books in four chests was the first book library in the Americas. Obviously, the Mayans and the Aztecs had uh, their own kinds of books, uh, which fold outwards like maps. Uh, these would have been excluded from the library. So the entire idea of a universal library starts to become problematized when you realize that just by saying books, it means it's no longer really universal. Um, so, I think this is a decision that lives with us today. Um, I'm going to wrap up the lecture by suggesting uh, that we are, all of us, living in Borges's uh, universal, uh, infinite library. All of us, even today. Um, because, of course, the next person to try after Hernando uh, to collect every book in the world was the Google Books project, right? Uh, which uh, about 12 years ago tried to collect every book in the world and scan it and make it freely available online. As I'm sure you will know, very frustratingly, uh, copyright law meant that it didn't work. Uh, and so now you can read about three pages uh, in the middle of every book, which is a very strange way to read books. Uh, but it means that uh, we are all living in a basically infinite library, which is the internet. Uh, it goes on forever. I've looked for the end of it, and I haven't found it. I don't know if any of you have found the end of the internet. Uh, but if you do, I, I'd like to know where it is. Um, but I think it, like Hernando's experience, uh, of his universal library, which ends up being bounded by the decision to collect books. The fact that we live in this universal or infinite library that is the internet excludes huge numbers of experiences and types of knowledge and ways of experiencing and interacting with the world that uh, cannot be stored in that kind of space, in that kind of library. Um, so, I think to a certain extent, and especially in light of world politics, how world politics is being shaped and dominated by the fact that we now live in this infinite library, um, and in different parts of this infinite library, all desperately searching for the other people in the library who seem to be other places reading books that don't make any sense to us. Uh, I think we, we need to learn from that experience uh, searching, perhaps, for the, the catalogue of catalogues of, of the internet. Um, I'm hoping that one of you sitting here knows the way out. Thank you. <laughs>